and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. Today I want to talk about DNA and the history of the discovery of this molecule, which will hopefully give you some context into which you can put all the modern discoveries in molecular biology, the human genome, bioinformatics, and so much more. So we're going to take a step back and start back in the mid-1800s. That's actually when nucleic acids were discovered. And shortly thereafter, Phoebus Levine discovered all of the components of DNA and actually defined the unit, including the sugar, the phosphate, and the base, which he called a nucleotide. That he got correct. Unfortunately, he didn't quite get the structure. He actually thought it was organized in tetrads. He said there were four nucleotides per molecule and that this made such a simple structure that it couldn't possibly be the key to uh, unlocking heredity. Now, unfortunately, he was incorrect on both of those counts. He died in 1940 before the importance of his work was really fully understood, but he was a major contributor. Frederick Griffith actually was a, um, a bacteriologist who studied two strains of streptococcus that caused pneumonia, and he was the first person to actually demonstrate bacterial transformation. So let's take a look and see what he did. He used two strains of streptococcus, one that is called type S. S is for smooth. These smooth colonies make a capsule which make the bacteria virulent and, and deadly, so they cause the mice to die. There is also a strain type R, which is non-virulent or harmless. R is for rough, so they do not have that smooth capsule. And mice, when exposed to it, they do just fine. So here's how it works. If you take the rough, non-virulent strain injected into a mouse, no problem. If you take the smooth strain, the virulent strain, inject that into a mouse, mouse dies. If you heat kill the smooth strain, so you kill the bacteria first, the mouse will live. Here's the perplexing one. If you mix the rough strain and the heat killed smooth strain together, the mouse dies. So there's a transformation that took place. The rough strain was transformed in some way by the heat killed smooth strain. The question was, how did that happen? Now Griffith did not figure this out. This question was answered by three people, Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod, and Macklin McCarty. And their experiments in 1944 explained Frederick Griffith's results. They determined what actually caused the transformation. And they figured this out by taking the live rough and the heat-treated S, just exactly the same as Griffith had done, but they mixed them with one of two enzymes. One group was mixed with a protease. A protease destroys protein. The other was mixed with a DNAase, which destroys DNA. So here's what they did. They took the non-virulent strain, they mixed it with the heat-killed smooth virulent strain. One group got the protease, inject into a mouse, the mouse died. The other group was mixed with the DNAase, injected into mice, the mice live. So this showed that it was the DNA that was responsible for the transformation because if you chop up the DNA with the DNAase, it's not virulent anymore. This was a really, really big discovery. It was published in February 1944, and here they suggest that it is DNA and not protein that may be the hereditary material of bacteria, and they propose perhaps in higher organisms as well. So now we have the DNA discovery timeline with the structure of nucleic acids, what DNA is made of, Griffith, who did the first transformation, and then Avery, McLeod, and McCarty, who explained the mechanism of that transformation. And now things are really going to start to heat up. There was someone who started counting nucleobases. His name was Edwin Chargoff. Chargoff emigrated to the United States during the Nazi era, and he became a professor of biochemistry at Columbia University Medical School. And he actually was interested in percentages of the different nucleobases, and he started to notice something really strange. He looked at different organisms, and he simply measured the amounts of the four bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And no matter what organism that he looked at, he found the following trends. So here's an octopus. And here you notice that the amounts of adenine and thymine are almost the same. 
the amount of cytosine and guanine is almost the same. Well, that's odd. He looked at a sea urchin, and guess what? He got the same thing. A and T, about the same. C and G, about the same. A rat, guess what? The same thing. And a grasshopper, same thing. And this is really pretty bizarre. Oh, he looked at humans too, of course, and he found exactly the same result. This came to be known as Shargoff's rules. The amount of adenine and thymine were always in balance, and the amount of cytosine and guanine always in balance. Now, this was a really big discovery, but he himself didn't actually realize the importance of these findings. He did, however, share his discovery with Watson and Crick at the Cavendish Lab in Cambridge in 1952, and Watson and Crick actually knew what it meant. Um, Shargoff was actually left out of all the big recognition of the discovery of DNA. And after the Nobel Prize was awarded, which he got no part in, he became kind of a recluse and spent the rest of his life writing to scientists about why he was excluded. Oh, well. Meanwhile, Hershey and Chase had some pretty amazing experiments going on with phages. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. So we call them a bacteriophage or just a phage for short. They are made of either DNA or sometimes RNA. And then the rest of the phage is made of protein. So that's going to make up the head, the tail, the tail fibers. Kind of looks like a lunar lander, doesn't it? So what Hershey and Chase did was they used a bacterial cell. You'll notice there's a genome in there of the bacteria. The bacteria, of course, has its own nuclear material. That's going to be the host. And then they took bacteriophages labeled one of two ways, either with radioactive sulfur, and that allowed them to follow the proteins in the phage, or they used radioactive DNA to follow the movement of DNA during the infection. Here's what they did. They took the labeled phages, they would expose them, allow them to infect the bacteria, and then they would separate what was in the bacteria from what was not in the bacteria by centrifugation, right? So you spin the tubes really fast. And what you get is the supernate, which is the fluid on top, everything outside the cells. And in the pellet, you get the compressed bacterial cells and everything that's inside. So here's how it was done. To label the proteins, they used radio-labeled sulfur, S35. So now they're going to be able to follow the proteins in the phage and see what happens. They allow them to infect, and then the phage will disengage. The result was no radioactive material inside the pellet. It was all in the supernatant, all in the fluid outside. So anything that was protein from the phage did not get into the bacterial cells. What about the DNA? So label the DNA with P32, radioactive phosphorus, and allow the phages to infect, just like before, and then centrifuge and see where the radioactivity ends up. And now all the radioactivity is in the pellet. It's all in the bacteria. There's no radioactivity in the fluid on top. This came as a big surprise to a lot of people, and they were very hesitant in the way they said it. But Hershey and Chase concluded that it was the DNA and not the protein that was the genetic material, and that the only real need for the protein was to sort of serve as packaging, you know, to, to cover the thing. So it's the DNA. Now there's a mountain of evidence saying that it's the DNA that's the genetic material. But the question was, what does this DNA look like and how does it work? Unfortunately, there was a lot of confusion about this because DNA exists in two forms. The A form, which most people were looking at, it was easier to get at, it's dry. And then the B form, which is actually what DNA really looks like inside cells. A lot of people were looking at a mixture of the two. Some famous model builders, Watson and Crick, came up with their first model in 1951, and they described DNA as a double helix with sugars and phosphates at the center and the nucleobases facing the outside. This was incorrect. It made absolutely no chemical sense. All those negatively charged phosphates on the inside would have been pretty messy, and the thing probably would have exploded with negative charges. But that's okay. They threw in some cations, calcium and magnesium. There was absolutely no data to support this. And that was actually kind of an embarrassment. Linus Pauling, who discovered the structure of the alpha helices and the beta sheets in proteins, he came up with a triple helix model, again, with the phosphates and the sugar on the inside and the nucleobases on the outside. He was most certainly looking at 
X-ray crystallography images that were mixtures of both the A and B form. If you look at images like that, you really do see something that looks almost like a triple helix. That turned out to be incorrect. We have three people in this story, Francis Crick, James Watson. They were working at the Cavendish Labs in Cambridge, and Maurice Wilkins and someone you may have never heard of, Rosalind Franklin at King's College in London. Rosalind Franklin was an x-ray crystallographer who really didn't get along well with anybody, especially not with Wilkins. And what happens next? There's a lot of debate and books written about it. The story kind of goes like this. Rosalind took a lot of amazing photographs of the B form of DNA. She figured out how to see the wet form, the form that exists in cells. This is probably the most famous image that she got. They call it uh, photo 51. And this photo shows very clearly the X in the middle that is the sign of a double helix. Rosalind was a stickler for detail, and she was not prepared to publish this until she finished all her calculations. But somehow, Maurice Wilkins got photo 51 from her desk in King's College and managed to get it to Watson and Crick in Cambridge. Now, when they saw the image, they knew exactly what it meant, and they knew that their model from 1951 was backwards or inside out. And ta-da, the model builders built the model based on Rosalind's image, and we have the paper that most people know where they describe what DNA looks like. A lot of people are not aware that three papers were published, one right after the other, in the April 25th, 1953 edition of the journal Nature. The first one was the Watson and Crick paper. The second one was by Stokes and Wilkins. The third was by Rosalind Franklin and her assistant, Raymond Gosling. The reason why Rosalind Franklin did not share in the Nobel Prize was because, unfortunately, she had already passed away, and Nobel Prizes are only given to living people. Almost more disappointing, though, is that neither of the three acknowledged the importance of her work in their discovery. And for that, I believe there really is no excuse. Many, many people have come to think that they were the ones responsible for the discovery because their article was listed first and that Franklin was merely cooperating. That could not have been farther from the truth. Rosalind died at the age of 37 from ovarian cancer, and it's believed that her exposure to x-rays from all of her work was most likely a contributing factor. She contributed not only to the DNA story, but she was a huge contributor during the war effort, uh, making more effective gas masks. Uh, she worked on coal, and she worked on the structure of viruses as well. Uh, I think James Watson kind of said it himself in this quote in 1999, you can read it for yourself. If you read the different accounts of what happened to the DNA story, uh, you get pretty different views um, of what actually happened, but uh, I kind of let Watson speak for himself here. So now you can see how all of these experiments kind of lined up and ultimately led to the correct double helix structure for DNA. Watson and Crick certainly owe many other people a debt of gratitude, um, but they are generally the ones who get the credit. Now we know that DNA is a double-stranded helix with a backbone made of sugar and phosphate groups running anti-parallel. Hydrogen bonds between the nucleobases, A with T and G with C, that explains why they are always in the same amounts. Um, and the sequence of nucleobases is what codifies the sequence of amino acids in a protein. It is a truly amazing structure, and the history of its discovery, I think, equally amazing. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your support by clicking like, share, and subscribe. Visit on Facebook, follow on Twitter. Good luck.